All right, this is Dr. Morton recording a lecture for Monday, the uh, 16th of November. So uh, this is for logic design, and here's our syllabus. So we're week 13, believe it or not. This is the next to last week of the semester. And if you scroll up, that's the last week. Now, not strictly speaking, but we have Monday and Wednesday that week, and then Thanksgiving on Thursday, and then no school on Friday, and then on the following Monday, which is uh, November 30th, that is, uh, well, November 30th and then Wednesday, December 2nd. So we don't have, uh, we don't have two more, we have after this week, we really just have one week, uh, well, we have four days of classes, that's it. So a week and a day of classes, but it's, it's like parts of two weeks. Okay, so anyway, that's all there is to it. Um, so we're rapidly getting to the end, and there's still some things to cover. Uh, fortunately, we're ahead a little bit, so instead of covering 16, which we already covered on Friday, I'm going to cover 17 today. And now 17 uh, deals with, uh, it's the final uh, lecture on hardware description languages. And if you remember, uh, we've talked about two, Verilog and uh, VHDL. Now, the, the, the hardware description language that's used in the textbook uh, is VHDL, but almost all of the courses in our department, I guess really in, in all the courses in our department, use uh, Verilog. And Verilog is, is, uh, is pretty much the, uh, the hardware description language that's used for the most part for, um, to make most of the integrated circuits in the United States. Um, there may be, um, uh, in Europe, they tend to use a little more VHDL, and there is some VHDL used in the United States for sure. It, it tends to be used a little more for simulation, um, where that's kind of the, the end objective. Anyhow, um, so we are, we'll, go, we'll talk about both, uh, and there, there is sort of an evolution uh, taking place, and we're probably going to eventually move to either System C or System Verilog or something like that when they become fully mature. Okay, so let's press on. Let's see, I could have waited on this, I guess. All right, and... All right. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so... Um, all right, so somehow that didn't work. I, I don't know. I'm confused. Okay, let, sorry. Let me let me uh, pause this for a second. Okay, so um, so here we go. Before I dig into the very log, though, I am going to uh, make sure uh, I'm going to go over uh, an additional um, sequential design uh, problem and uh, just kind of go through how to do a sequential graph. And I'm going to hopefully do a number of these. Uh, before we uh, uh, finish up. All right, so so this problem is a more sequential circuit has one input X and one output Z. Now this is a more. So remember in a more, the outputs are going to be associated with the states, not the links. And the output will not depend upon the next uh, input. It will only depend upon the current states of the flip-flops. Now obviously, the next state of the flip-flops clearly will depend in part on the uh, on the next input x and on the current inputs uh, on the on the current state, but uh, <clears throat> but but the the next inputs are not directly involved in calculating the new output. It's only as it determines the next state that it affects the new output. So z will equal one if and only if the most recent input was a one and it was preceded by exactly two zeros. Derive a state graph for this circuit. Look at the example sequence to see how it should work. All right, so normally we set up a little example sequence. And uh, <clears throat> I think I shut that down. Let's see. Yeah, I did. Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> so I'm, I, I'm not going to pull that up. But what I will do is uh, <clears throat> I'm going to work through the state graph. Okay, so here's the problem. We have uh, a black box. We have one input x. Uh, so usually it is a good idea to draw draw a little black box. So we'll we'll, we'll do some pins. Okay. So 
so here's our black box and we have one input x and one output z so this is the output and this is the input now uh, we also do have a, an edge clock and uh, and so with each clock edge it tells us that the new input x has arrived now the reason we have to have a clock is because we we don't know we're in the sample x without the clock and also it's also when we change states and everything so there's a lot of lot of a lot of good reasons for having a clock and what we have to design is what goes in to this black box as and that's typical and what's inside the black box we will call a sequential circuit uh, so let's see so I'm gonna I'm gonna erase so okay so one input x one output z and z equals one if and only if the x is two zeros and a one okay so uh, so let's let's erase this and then we'll, we'll do some sample inputs All right, now let's let's do let's do let's do a little sample input here. Um, yeah, um, well, maybe I don't know. Maybe we can make this work. Um, yeah, okay. So what I'll do, yeah, okay, and then I'm gonna, yeah, we'll do this. Okay, so here's our here's our here's our example sequence. Now, if you look at this, what should our output be? Well, our, our output should be 0, 0, 0, 0. Should it be a 1 here? No, because it was not preceded by exactly two zeros. It had four zeros in front of it, so it's still a 0. A 0, a 0. What about here? Yes, that's your first one, because it was preceded by exactly two zeros. 0, 0, 0, 0. Nope, was preceded by five, four zeros. And then 0, 0. One, yep, that's correct. Zero, 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 nope. Zero, 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 one. All right. So that's that's that would be the correct uh, the correct result here. And obviously, uh, this is this is uh, x equals, and this is z equals. So this is this is a good test sequence. All right, now no, I, I can do that. So I think I can do this though. Okay, uh, maybe we just move this all the way up. Yeah, good. Okay, perfect. All right, so. Um, all right, so we're going to start with graph S0, and then, and then we're going to uh, uh, work through. And uh, I need to, yeah. Okay, so first we get S0, and we know that, um, we know that in S0, we, we, don't, we assume nothing. So we assume our previous input, I guess for the sake of, you know, at the beginning of the problem, we'll assume the previous input was a 1. But since we didn't get 0, 0, 1, we don't really have to worry about it. So in state S0, we assume we have no, uh, we have, all we have are 1s, basically. That's what we're assuming. All right. Now, if we get a 0, then we should go to node S1 that indicates that we have a 0. So, oh, well, if we get a 1, we'll just stay here. But if we get a 0, we'll go to S1. Now the output in S0 will be 0, and in S1 the output will be 0 as well. Remember the outputs are associated with the nodes. Okay, then in S, then that takes care of two paths out of each node, because remember, with one input we get x to the 1 or 2, so we have to account for two paths out of each node. Now in S1 uh, we have two possibilities. We can get a 1 or a 0 for x, just like we did in, in S0. Now if we get a 1, that's not what we want. 
So we're going back to S0. But if we get a 0, that is what we want. So we're going to go to S2. All right. Now in S2, we still have to put a 0 because we do not have the sequence yet. We just have 0, 0. But in, in S2, if we get a 1, now we'll have the sequence. So if we get a 1, then we should definitely go to, uh, we should definitely go to S, uh, S, well, S3 and output a 1. But what if we get a 0? If we get a 0, uh, so go to S3 and a 1, and that's the target, and we're outputting the 1. Now we have to have a dedicated node to output a 1 because the outputs are always associated with the nodes. But if we get that 0, we have to go to S4 and output a zero. We can't go back here because this means we have three zeros. We can never have a one until we get another one. And then if we're in S3 and we get a uh, uh, a zero, then we can go back to here because we might have the first zero in the next sequence. But if we get a one, we have nothing. We have to start over at S0. But if we're in S4, and we get a, uh, a zero, what do we do? We just stay there. If we get a one, we go back and start over. All right, so that's what the state graph looks like. One, two, three, four, five nodes. Now, the first thing we do is, is build a state table. Now, in this case, the state table uh, has five states, S0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we just can take all the information straight from the state graph. So in state S0, here we are. On a 0, we're going to S1, and on a 1, we're staying there. S1, S0, and what are we outputting? A 0, because the output is directly associated with the state. In S1, if we get a 1, we're going back to S0. If we get a 0, we're going to S2, so S2 and S0. And we output a zero because we still haven't gotten this, the, the state yet. All right. And then in S2, we have two possibilities. We can get a one, which would give us the target. Okay. And that's S3. Or we can, um, we can, um, sorry, and S3, so, uh, sorry, I got this. So S3 is our target. So if, if, uh, if we're in S3, if we get a 0, then we can go back to S1. We, had, we have our first 0 for our next sequence. If we get a 1, then we don't have anything, so we go back to S0. All right, now in S, uh, and then in S4, if we get a 0, we're just going to stay here, and a 1 will go back. We already covered S4. So, uh, so that pretty much covers the whole thing. So now we have two paths out of every node, and we've accounted for the entire state table. Now... What's the next step? The next step is flip-flop state assignment. In this case, we'll just do straight binary sequence. So how many flip-flops do we need for five states? We have to have three uh, <clears throat> because uh, we can only do four as a maximum with two flip-flops. So with three flip-flops, we can do eight. So we go ahead and we'll assign our flip-flops A, B, C. And uh, we'll code the states. We'll just do straight binary order. So ABC will do 0, 0, 0 for S0, 0, 0, 1 for S1, uh, 0, 1, 0 for S2, 0, 1, 1 for S3, and 1, 0, 0 for S4. And then we'll, we'll, take, uh, <clears throat> we'll take that those codings and substitute in for each one of our uh, variables. So for S0, we'll substitute in 0, 0, 0, which means for ABC. For S1, we'll substitute in 0, 0, 1. For 2, 0, 1, 0. For 3, 0, uh, uh, 0 1, 1. And for 4, 1, 0, 0. And that should, that should be all the states we need. All right, so, um, so now we, we substitute those things in. And we also have some don't care. So here we, we only had one, two, three, four, five states represented. But with three variables, we can, we can represent up to eight states. So we have three don't cares. The bottom three rows are don't cares, five, six, and seven. Don't cares, don't cares, and don't cares for the output. All right, so now we can do our k-maps. So what, first question is, what are the variables for the k-map? Well, we have our, our present states here, A, B, C. And I guess I probably should put that in.
and then we should just do uh, A, B, C, like that, and maybe we'll make them smaller so they so they actually work. Yeah, and the same thing here. We have ABC here, and we have ABC here. For x equals 0, we have ABC, and for x equals 1, we have ABC. And the output, though, is just the single digit of 0. We don't have to have an, uh, we don't have to have, uh, an output columns for x equals 0 and x equals 1. Why? Because it's not a Mealy machine. It's a Moore machine. And the outputs are only associated with our current state, so in 0, we output a 0, in 1, a 0, in 2, a 0, in 3, a 1, and in 4, a 0. And here we have don't cares. All right, so we pull these out into the map. Our map has uh, the four variables, input x and a, b, and c. So the top row will be x, a, and the side will be b, c. Just like this. x up here, uh, a in the center two columns, b in the bottom two rows, and c in the middle two rows. Of course, the top two rows would be b prime. The first two columns would be x prime. The outside two columns would be a uh, would be a prime. The middle two columns are a. And you can see the don't cares help us a little bit. And we have uh, we can group these two boxes and these two boxes, and we can get x prime b c prime plus x prime a b prime. And then here we can get uh, uh, x prime b prime c plus x b c prime. And here we get uh, we have this one all by itself, x prime, a prime, b prime, c prime. And then we can have x prime, b, c, and x, b, x, b, c prime. So that's that's how that fits together. And then finally, the output is just one term, x prime, b, c. All right, so you can see, we only plotted the ones. I left off the zeros because they, they make it a little confusing. Now, the good news is, or uh, the bad, the we, we didn't really explore what our max term solution would be. We only looked at the min term solution. But you can see from the map that our max term solution uh, could be pretty could be pretty good. I mean, for starters, uh, this one would be, well, this would be a little worse. It'd have two terms, but they'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 boxes would be one term. And then then we have uh, uh, all eight of these boxes for another term. So, so our terms would be pretty simple. They'd only be uh, they'd only be uh, x and uh, well, so, yeah, sorry, x. Uh, would be x that it would be uh, uh, c prime and uh, and b prime. Yeah, so x plus c prime, or x times, so x times b times c. Well, exactly. x prime times b times c. It would be exactly this. So the, the uh, SOP and the POS solutions are absolutely identical, actually. They're both x prime bc. Um, because these are, this, this could be construed as SOP form or POS form. Okay, and uh, so I won't go through it for these. And then, um, so that's, then you can take these equations and you can build out these circuits and that's your, that's your completed solution. All right, so we'd always finish up by just uh, either simulating it by hardware description language uh, or we'd build a little test article and simulate that uh, or run that and see if it works like we expect. And then we build the hardware. And uh, the hardware will include these these circuits and the, and the three flip flops, and an input and an output transformer, no doubt. And that that's that would basically be it. All right. So let's talk about uh, how we use hardware description languages in sequential design. Well, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about how you do sequential design with VHDL and Verilog. And in VHDL, we use what's called a process block. And in Verilog, we use what's called an always block. So in other words, we have um, our normal modules. But within those modules, we have special blocks that, uh, that 
allow us to do sequential design. And uh, those blocks are basically uh, typically triggered by edge signals, like a clock or maybe a set or a reset. Uh, and other, like a latch or other, other uh, you know, signals that, uh, that trigger an execution of some particular amount of code. So we'll talk a little bit about just uh, some of the general issues with signals and constants, uh, arrays, operators, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit how, how most of the time or often when you do a design, you're going to incorporate some, uh, what we call it IP, intellectual property. So you'll, you'll include some other packages uh, from other libraries. In some cases, you'll, you'll purchase those things uh, in some cases, they're 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 uh, part of the uh, part of the uh, integrated development environment and they sort of come with that. Um, these are all the this whole world is uh, operates on IEEE standards, and um, we'll talk a little about uh, uh, compiling, simulating, uh, and uh, and then synthesizing the uh, either the bit files or the are all the photo mass that it needs that it takes to actually manufacture an integrated circuit. Again, just to review, we've seen this before. We have three levels of uh, description. These are these are more um, uh, loose concepts, and they are hard 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 descriptions uh, because the behavioral level can kind of flow. You can have parts that are very behavioral, and other parts that are more uh, where we define some of the data flow, and then and then even some. Uh, parts of the same module where it might be more structural. So, uh, so these are, you know, you, you don't have to memorize this, but uh, sometimes I ask what the three levels of description are. And so that would be behavioral, data flow, and structural. And uh, behavioral is a fairly high level description, uh, again, where you, you know, the sum S equals A plus B. But notice here, you, you haven't specified how many bits A is, how many bits B is, how many bits the sum is. Uh, there's no carry in or carry out specified. Uh, <clears throat> when you get down to the, to the uh, data flow level, now you're talking about registers, bit widths, and things like that, so that you uh, begin, to, begin to know uh, there are more details that the designer's including. And then finally, when you get down to a schematic, you're pretty much uh, laying out exactly how you circuit, want the circuit to be. But uh, then the synthesizer will create, take this, these descriptions, whichever level you're working at, and turn them into either a bit file that gets loaded into a programmable device or a set of photo masks and steps to use in the foundry to actually turn a silicon wafer into an integrated circuit. Actually, a whole bunch of integrated circuits all at once on the same wafer. So. Uh, there's a, this is just kind of a, we call it a silly function, okay? So this shows you how it looks in Verilog and how it looks in VHDL. So in Verilog, our module is all one thing. We have a, a, a module keyword, the name of the module, and then we have the port list. Input A, B, and C, and output Y. And then we have uh, how the internal parts of the module work. Y equals uh, the inverse of A ended with the inverse of B ended with the inverse of C. And these are all bitwise, bitwise ORed with, and all these various things. So that's the description. There weren't a lot of parentheses used here, so this is a little confusing. It might be difficult to really uh, figure out exactly how this is going to work unless you begin to put in parentheses to really make it clear. Uh, on the, and then your end module keyword, and you're done. Whereas in the VHDL block, we have... Uh, uh, we have we first have uh, an entity, and here the entity is called silly function, and it and then we have a port, and the port list includes A, B, C, their input standard logic, and Y and output standard logic, and that's the end. And um, so then that's just the port list. So the so the entity just describes what the signals are that uh, appear to the outside world. Now here in the entity, we we can use this. Uh, uh, we can use this, uh, sorry, here in the architecture, we can use this entity. And so we, we call it synth, which is the name of the architecture of silly function, which refers back to the entity is. And then, you know, it's Y equals not A and then not B and not C or A and not B and not C. So uh, I don't I don't know that if I, 
I don't think I totally duplicated this, actually. Uh, I think I made this one more complicated. But any, at any rate, um, <clears throat> this gives you a little bit of a view of how they differ. So it's very similar, but there are just some syntactic differences. And the big one is that here we have it all in one thing, and here we split it up into an entity and an architecture. Now, several entities, or se sorry, several architectures could use the same port list specified by this entity. And... But the architecture is referred to as synth. So, all right. And so assignment statements, these are, these are, this is an example of one here, and this is an example of one here. This in VHDL, this one in Verilog. All right, so in VHDL, we have the signal name. We use this less than equal operator. Then we have an expression, a optional after and specify a delay. And then in Verilog, we do it a little bit differently. We use the keyword assign. Then we do the signal name, just like we have here, a pound delay. So if we want to specify the delay, we put it pound, and then we put the, uh, a number here, which represents a number of uh, uh, usually nanoseconds. Uh, but it depends on, there's a keyword that begins your code that specifies what the, what the actual uh, units of that number would be, whether it's you know, tens of nanoseconds, nanoseconds, or what, and then and then you're, there's some expression that re, that gets uh, evaluated and assigned to this signal after uh, some delay. Now the delay is nothing that's synthesizable. This delay is only used in simulations. Uh, these assignment statements in both VHDL and Verilog only execute uh, when they when something on the right, when one of the expressions on the right side changes, or the expression on the right side changes. And as soon as it changes at any time, then this uh, this executes and it's the, the recalculated value of the expression is assigned to the signal name. This happens continuously, just like it would if this were, were an AND gate and one of the inputs changed. Then the output would follow it in just a small, after a small amount of delay, just like here. Um, What's confusing about this is when you put these in a in a program, the order doesn't matter. Even the location of the program doesn't matter. Where when, it doesn't matter where they are. They don't they don't execute sequentially when you encounter this one and then the next one and the next one. They they are active all the time and they execute whenever the right side changes. Same is true in Verilog. There is in uh, VHDL a, a slightly different type of equal sign, which is colon equals. And and this is uh, this actually uh, does make them more executable in 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 sequence. There's no equivalent to this in Verilog. All right, so here's some assignment statements in Verilog. So this this is where we assign after a 10 nanosecond delay. X has the value of B and to a C. Now in Verilog, our our operators are like the C operators, whereas in uh, Whereas in VHDL, the operators are, we usually, use, we have the keywords and, or, nand, nor, uh, and such things. All right. So remember, you always have to have, uh, for a VHDL module, an entity declaration that lays out the, the external I.O. signals, the port, and an architecture declaration that describes what the internal workings of this module will be. A Verilog module, though, is just all in one thing. It specifies the port list, and then it specifies what happens inside the module. Um, in Verilog here, uh, just like in C, we have logical AND and we have bitwise AND. We have logical OR and bitwise OR, and these are exclusive ORs, which are always bitwise. Uh, so if you're using vectors, then it makes a big difference whether you use logical or bitwise. If you're using single bits, it doesn't really make any difference. Okay, and then, uh, and here's another example. So uh, here's an entity in VHDL, um, and you can give it an initial value if you want. Um, in Verilog, uh, the, uh, the, the port list is in the in, in the module name, so in in uh, in Verilog you don't have an entity and then an architecture. It's just all in one module. Um, so 
in VHDL, it is generally not case sensitive. All the statements end in a semicolon, just like in Verilog, just like in C. Comments start with a dash, and keywords are reserved. And variables can have letters, numbers, and an underscore. They can't end in an underscore, and they have to start with a letter. That's VHDL. But in Verilog, uh, it is case sensitive. Statements end like VHDL with a semicolon. Comments, instead of with a dash, they're back two forward slices, just like in C. Keywords are reserved. Names of variables, they can have letters, numbers, an underscore, or a dollar sign. They have to start with a letter or an underscore. And they can be up to 10, 24 characters maximum, whereas there's no maximum, uh, no maximum with, uh, uh, with VHDL. And um, yeah, the VHDL names can't end with an underscore, and you can't have two underscores together. They have to be all in the same line of code. That's the only restriction. But of course, that would normally probably be less than 1024. All right. Um, types of variables. So in VHDL, we have integers, bits, and, uh, and standard logic bits. Uh, they can be single values, or they can be vectors, which means multiple bits. Very log, same thing, single values or vectors. And we have integers, bits. Uh, uh, our vectors are only, uh, our, our variables actually, not just vectors, uh, only have four logic values uh, for each bit. And that is uh, one, zero, disconnected or high Z, and unknown, and we use an X for that. Whereas in Verilog, there are actually nine different types. We'll look at those in a minute. Uh, and But the, the, the five that are really important are U, X, one, zero, and high Z or Z. Okay. So here are, the, here are the standard logic nine values. And the uh, the W, L, H, and negative, I don't even know what, I, I've never used these, I don't know what those are. But most of the time, the only ones we really encounter in VHDL are these. And in, and, uh, in Verilog, the, uh, we, only, we only need these four because we lump unknown and uh, uninitialized into the same one. Now, interestingly, if you're dealing with a wire in Verilog, then uh, we don't use X if it's, if it's uninitialized or unknown. We use Z, which means it's not connected to anything. Whereas uh, Z cannot be used with a register. Uh, it has to be used with, uh, uh, it has to be, if you don't know what it is, it's unknown or uninitialized, then it would be X, not a Z. Because a register will be outputting something, we just don't know what it is. Whereas a, a wire can be absolutely disconnected. All right. Uh, for both Verilog and VHDL, signals can be ins, outs, or in outs, which means bi directional. Uh, internal signals are declared in the case of VHDL within the architecture, case of Verilog within the module. Uh, and, but there's no associated uh, mode in, in, out, or bidirectional for these internal signals. They can be whatever. Uh, you, you don't have to specify. Here are the operators in, uh, uh, in, in VHDL. So the binary ones are actually words, not symbols. So and, or, nan, nor, x, or, x, nor. Uh, and then our shift operators are like this. Our relational are equal, not equal, less than, less than or equal, greater than, greater than or equal. These are not to be, this is not to be confused with the assignment operator. So it, it depends on context, but if it's used in, uh, you wouldn't, yeah, it's, well, it should be easy to tell if it's being used uh, as less than or equal uh, or, the, uh, or the equal operator. Uh, and then here we have plus, minus, and, uh, and, um, the ampersand. Uh, the uh, ampersand is used for concatenation. And then, of course, the unary plus minus, that just changes the, well, it makes them negative. And then we have multiplication, division, the modulo, and the remainder. And then we have inverse, absolute value, and exponentiation. Okay. Um, so we don't define math in VHDL. We don't define math on bit vectors. In Verilog, you can do addition and subtraction, but that's it. Uh, we uh, 
we have when we simulate things we have this concept of delta delay i'm i'm not gonna uh, i don't th i don't think you need to understand that uh, it's but when when you simulate your verilog or your vhdl code uh, you write a test bench which is another program that basically handles inputting all the variables into your your test module and it evaluates all the signals that go in or that come back out so it puts in the signals that go in it evaluates the signals coming out and uh, and uh, th you do that so that you can uh, test your module and make sure it's going to work the way you want it to um, you uh, most of the time you you write your code in modules uh, and you can think of a module similar to a uh, a function in, in say uh, C language but uh, you typically have a top level module and then that module calls a bunch of sub modules some of whom call sub modules and some of those call sub modules and so forth in 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 Verilog there are a couple of additional things called tasks and functions which you can also use and there's kind of like mini modules in a in a way um, you cannot define modules within a module uh, and uh, when you're when you're using a procedural block you can't put a module in you can't call a module inside a procedural blocker we don't really we don't use the term call a module we, we talk about instantiating a module and the reason for that one of the big differences between say a function in C and a module in hardware description languages every time you instantiate a module you create a new set of that same hardware so you're actually making more gates uh, more connections uh, it's you're actually making more hardware uh, whereas in C you could call the same function 50 times but you only have you only you only actually have one set of that code and it's just used 50 times as opposed to uh, uh, actually, uh, actually, every time you instantiate a module, you make another copy of it in in uh, in hardware. All right, um, all right. So, so concurrent statements are just basically combinational logic. So we finished the part of the course that was focused on combinational design. That's all this is. Concurrent statements are just con combinational designs. And whenever a variable on the right side changes, it's immediately assigned assigned to the left side, uh, whatever that signal is. We have um, we have in VHDL we have standard assignment statements, conditional assignment statements, and selected signal assignment statements. And we've already kind of looked at some of these. So here's a here's a uh, here's uh, an example of an adder. First, you do the entity where you define the port list. So the external world is going to see uh, one bit of A, one bit of B, one bit of carry in, and their input standard logic. And then it's going to send out one bit of sum and a, one bit of carry out. And those are output standard logics. That carry out is just called carry, and the carry in is called C in. So that's the entity. And then here's the structure. The sum is just the exclusive OR of A, B, and carry in, and the carry out is this equation here. A ended with B quantity or C in ended with the quantity A or with B. So uh, so that's how that's that's how you write the carry, that's how you write the sum. And uh, and then this basically is a is a full adder, a full one, you know, one bit adder. One bit of A, one bit of B, one bit of carry in, generating one bit of sum and one bit of carry out. Now, if we want to do uh, sequential design, we have to use process blocks. And uh, in VHDL, we call them process blocks. In uh, Verilog, we call them always blocks. Uh, the process blocks and the always blocks are they work very similarly a process block and an always block both have uh, their input signals in uh, parentheses right after the keyword process and then you put uh, the uh, the signals in parentheses and that those signals are called the sensitivity list and it's called that in both Verilog and VHDL and what that means is 
when one of those signals ch changes, uh, then uh, if it's the if, if well so in when one of those signals changes, it triggers execution of this process block. Now, in in both Verilog and VHDL, we normally only work well, we're typically working with edge signals, and so um, so we're triggering it on a specific edge typically. All right, and then we use instead of uh, in both VHDL and uh, Verilog use the keywords begin and end instead of curly braces. Okay, so uh, so let's let's look at a D flip flop, and uh, so we'll see how this works. Okay, so here is a VHDL model of a flip flop. So first we use the keyword process. Then we have our sensitivity list, and we have the clock in that sensitivity list. Now, then we have the keyword begin, and then we have an if statement, and then we have uh, if clock tick event and clock equals one. Now, this clock tick event thing, uh, don't let that freak you out. This is, uh, and it's about the only one that's really goofy here, sorry. Uh, this is what's called, I call this an idiom. Uh, it's just like, uh, let's say, uh, you know, you might say, I feel stuffed like a turkey when you mean you've had a lot to eat. Well, that's an idiom, okay? Uh, clock, tick is, clock tick event is the same thing. This just means that clock just changed. This this gives it the edge characteristic. And it they kind of just made this up, but you have to put this in if you want it to be an edge triggered signal. So if clock tick event, so that means the clock just changed and the clock is equal to one. So that that would if the clock just changed and now it's one, then that defines a rising edge, and that's that would trigger execution of this block. Clock changed, and then if clock tick event and clock equals one. That's just how we write it, and we always write it that way. And it may not make a lot of sense, but you just kind of have to memorize that. Uh, there's a few just weird things in all these languages, and uh, clock tick event is one of the weird things in VHDL. It's just an idiom. All right. And then, then within this if statement, we have one, one assignment statement. Q is assigned the value of D. So this will not execute when D changes. It only executes when the rising edge of the clock hits. And that's one of the differences. If this were an assignment statement and not in a process block, then anytime D changed, Q would follow. But since it's in a process block, it's only limited to changing when the clock uh, edge hits, and in this case, only the rising edge. Then we have end if and end process. Now, uh, same thing here, only here, notice D is in the sensitivity list because this is a D gated latch. And the G is the gate. So when the gate is open, then you do want this to change if D changes. You want this to execute if D changes. So if your gate's open, then your output follows D. But if the gate's closed, then D can change and nothing will happen. Because it's, it's, it's D being assigned to Q is conditioned on the gate being open. But you have to put D in the sensitivity list, because if it weren't there, then uh, it would only execute when this gate changed. It wouldn't execute when D changed. So the gate might be opened, and then a little bit later, D might, D might uh, go from, say, 0 to 1. Well, if, if you didn't have D up here, then then yes, it would have executed when, when the gate was opened. But then as the gate stayed open, it, then later on D could change. And it wouldn't, if D weren't in the list, it would not trigger execution of this block. All right. And then here we have a, a clock and a clear knot. And so, uh, so if the clear knot is asserted, then it's going to prevent... Uh, it's going to basically override the clock. So if clear not equals zero, then Q equals zero. So we clear Q. Else if clock tick event and clock equals one, rising edge, then Q equals D, and if, and if. So you can see in this case, uh, this is this is a uh, uh, th this is a, a flip flop with a rising edge clock, a D flip flop with a rising edge clock, and a uh, and a, and a clear and a clear knot that is active uh, low. 
Now, one of the interesting things in this one, we only had the flip flop didn't have a Q and a Q prime. Normally, down here, out of this process block, we would have a statement that says Q prime equals the opposite of Q. That so, whenever Q changes this, then it automatically changes Q prime. All right. So the process block works with like this. We have the keyword process, and then we have the sensitivity list, then the begin, then statements, and then the end process statement. The uh, we can and then we can have conditional statements within this process block. We can use the if. Now, generally, we cannot use the if uh, outside of process blocks, and in Verilog, that's also true. We cannot use if statements outside of always blocks. They must be inside always blocks. So, if you want to have a conditional statement outside of an always block, you have to use you have to use something other than if. Okay. So here's a shift register. Uh, again, the, the sensitivity list has clock in it, and if clock tick event. So if the clock just changed and it's high, so that would be a rising edge signal again. If we said clock equals zero, then that would be falling edge. Then if clear equals one, so in this case, notice our clear is not in the sensitivity list. It's active high. So this clear is conditioned. It only it is it is a synchronous clear because it only takes effect on, on, uh, on rising edges of the clock. So the first thing we do is after the clock edge hits, we check the clear. And if it's, if it's true, then our 4-bit our output vector Q gets assigned four zeros. Else, if load is one and clear is not one, clear is, uh, is not asserted here, it's what we call de-asserted, then, uh, then we check load. If load is 1, then we take our, our 4 bits of D and we load it into Q. And then if load happens to be 1, uh, sorry, if load happens to also not be true, then we, we do the left shift if LS is 1. And what we do, this is, this is where we use the concatenation operator to concatenate part of the Q vector. And in this case, Q is uh, three down to or three down to zero, but now we're we're just using two down to zero. So we're using bits zero, one, and two. We're not using bit three, and we're concatenating those with RN as our low order bit. Now in in VHDL, the ampersand in this setting is a concatenation operator. Uh, in in v in Verilog, we use curly braces in a comma in here, because we don't use curly braces really for anything else. Unlike C, where we use curly braces all the time, uh, in Verilog, we use begin and end. And we use the same thing, in, for the most part, in VHDL. We use begin and end. So here we have begin, and then we have end process. Sometimes we just have begin and end. Sometimes we have begin and end a particular thing. In this case, end process. All right, I, I'm not going to go through the 741 counter. I think I'm going to skip this. Uh, but you can look at this. This just is an example of, a, of an actual part. The 74163 is a counter. It has it has a, a, a an active low node, uh, an active low an active low node load. I'm sorry, an active low load. It has an active low clear, and then it has either a rising edge or falling edge clock, and then it has P and T. Then it also has a D which is a 4-bit vector, and that's its output. And then we have count, which is uh, a just a single bit. And, and or sorry, uh, yeah, it, it's it's just a uh, let's see, no, it's a it's it's if it's an output, but it's a 4-bit output. And we also have so count is a 4-bit output, and Q out is also a 4-bit output. And they're standard logic vectors, three down to zero. And the reason we write this three down to zero instead of just like a normal array is because we want it ordered with the higher order variable first. All right. And then here's the architecture. So the architecture is going to use this port list. All these single bit signals, load not, clear not, P, T, and clock. And they're all inputs. And then the outputs are... Uh, uh, Four bits for D, and uh, uh, and then uh, 
four bits of C out. And um, yeah, so here's the architecture. So the first thing we do, um, we let Q out equals Q and C out equals then uh, Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0, and T. So that's the carry out. And then uh, because the T is one of the control signals. So this is it's kind of a complicated chip and I, I, I there's probably very little benefit to you comprehending it. This These extra signals, in this case the P and the T, uh, they have to do with daisy chaining these in groups of four together. And, uh, and these determine how it passes the count to the next group of four and and how and how when it's going to update the next group of four if it's going to update them all at once or if it's going to ripple effect or how it's going to be done all right and then we have uh within the process block so here's our sequential part and remember so this has a clock in it it has a synchronous uh, sorry an asynchronous clear and an asynchronous load asynchronous load and the uh so the clock, then, if we have clock tick event and clock equals one, so it's a rising edge clock, then if clear not is zero, we zero out Q. Else, we load Q with D. Again, four bits of Q going into receiving four bits of D. And then uh, we check P and end it with T. And if, they, if they're both one, then we, uh, we add one to Q. Now, in this case, we are allowed to do uh, simple math with uh, these uh, bit vectors, but you can't you can't multiply them, you can't divide them, you can't uh, uh, you can subtract one or you can subtract, but you you can't multiply, divide, you can't take square roots or you can't take sines or any of that. Can't do any math other than simple addition or subtraction. Now you now you can do math with integers, and that's fine. Uh, integers are, are typically 32 bits. But you, you, you can't do math with, with bit vectors, except addition and subtraction. All right. So I think that's it. All right. So I'm going to quit there. And uh, that should do it.